Welcome back, I'm That Chemist. So today we're going to do a Q&A. I posted on YouTube and in the Discord asking for questions, and several of you responded. So I've chosen some that I think will be interesting for people to hear. Favorite chemical, favorite chemical element. So I would say my favorite chemical probably has to be trimethyl oxonium tetrafluoroborate, and you'll see why in a minute. And my favorite chemical element has to be palladium. Palladium's good at catalyzing so many different reactions that it's essentially the modern day philosopher's stone. People wanted to turn anything into anything else before, and palladium is the closest thing to that that we have. So I would be a fool if I didn't say palladium was my favorite element. Now, I do think that the chemistry that it does is kind of like cheating, and it takes away from the rest of the field, but it's still a really cool element. And so the reason I like trimethyloxonium is because of the way it's made. So this is a really obscure reaction, which you can see from orgsin here, organic synthesis. You can see that starting with BF3 diethyl etherate and reacting that with epichlorohydrin in the presence of dimethyl ether, you get trimethyl oxonium tetrafluoroborate, as well as this interesting boronate complex from the epichlorohydrin. This is a reaction that's kind of like one of a kind in my mind, and it looks like a reaction from the future, so it's pretty cool. Do you have any undergraduate student stories, inside or outside of TAing? So here we have a picture, which is a meme that I made when I was supervising several undergrad students. Each of them has a, a different role here. This is a meme, it's called Me and the Boys, because we're all in the lab working together at the same time. Here we have a, a vacuum line covered in a red oil, and what happened was one of my undergraduate researchers was high vacuuming uh, a dithioester derivative, and it ended up being really dark red colored, and it was volatile enough that when he concentrated it on the high vac line, it ended up going and contaminating the whole thing, and so he ended up having to clean that out. Here we have me. I had to run a ton of IRs at one point in time, uh, right before we published stuff, and I had to make a bunch of compounds so that we could get IR data. That was like a little bit frustrating. We then had another undergraduate researcher who was using used coffee grounds to try and make uh, carbon nanosphere derivatives. And finally, we had one other undergrad who was using a low temperature cooler and silicone, silicon oil was how they were keeping the temperature low. And one day uh, we came into the lab and there was just silicon grease oil everywhere. Like the whole, the whole floor for most of the lab was covered in it. And even after wiping it all up, the lab was still slippery for several months afterwards. And so hence why we made this meme. It was just right right, right when this meme became a thing, and so that was kind of fun. But I do have a few more stories. So another time I had an undergrad researcher who was making a thionoester derivative, and they were heating this ester, some benzoate derivative, way above the boiling point of xylene in a closed vial. And so we were somewhere else in the lab, we heard a loud bang, and we went over. The vial's lid was gone, the top part of the vial was gone, but the vial was completely empty. Like there's no liquid left in it. There was like a little bit of white residue. And they were like, where did it go? And I just like crouched down and I pointed at the roof of the of the the fume hood. And all of the reaction mixture had just exploded up and stuck to the roof. So you had to wipe it off afterwards. Uh, another common story is if you've ever TA'd a lab before and you have to do melting point analysis, if you do melting point in capillaries, quite often what will happen is students will put the crystals in their capillary and then they'll accidentally put it into the melting point apparatus upside down and then just melt their compound right into the melting point apparatus. And so that's something that I experienced several times. Um, okay, and then one of my favorite ones is I was uh, TAing for an inorganic class and this one student had submitted their homework and they had a, they'd drawn a ship sinking um, and they drew them on the ship that was sinking and then they labeled it like, this is me and this ship is my grades. And they're like, please help. And, and I'm like, sorry, a captain goes down with a ship. <laughs> Okay, next one. Bro, who the F are you? For real, don't say that, chemist. Who am I? I'm Joey. Hopefully you like my sunglasses. Custom made. Do you do consulting as a side job? I am I am open to doing consulting work, especially if you have a need for synthetic consulting. If you're interested in having some consulting done, you're welcome to contact me via this email shown here. What reactions uh, you never ran but really wanted to try? What are reactions you never had but really wanted to try? So I really wanted to try palladium cross-coupling chemistry because it's so used and it's especially widely used in medicinal chemistry because it's fairly robust. Even if you get low yields, you can typically get enough material to push forward. So a Suzuki reaction would be an example of something I want to try or a Sonigashira coupling. And so this is just like a typical uh, palladium mediated Suzuki reaction. I also want to try metallophotoredox at some point. Do you ever use obscure, obscure reactions or reactions from new papers with low views? And so I would say I'm pretty good about keeping up to date with the literature, reading papers as they come out, you know, looking at stuff people are doing at conferences, and especially trying to use that chemistry to solve problems that I'm currently working on. 
And so for a while, uh, there was a point where activated esters were being looked at, or activated amides rather, were being looked at as an alternative to something like acyl halide. So people are able to make amides, or ester derivatives rather, from activated amides. Activated just means that they have some group that makes the nitrogen a better leaving group, so such as a Bach group, a benzyl group, etc. And so I had tried some of that chemistry on thioamide derivatives. Unfortunately, I didn't have too much success, um, but there are people more recently who have had success making thionoesters this way. Aside from theft, what is the best way to get chemical equipment for cheap? So I would never advocate you steal any chemical equipment whatsoever. Um, what I will say is that if you're looking to get cheap chemistry equipment, there's usually people in discords who are trying to get rid of old equipment or would be able to point you in the right direction. Those people tend to be in the know, and so I'd recommend going to those sorts of communities. What are some invaluable but lesser known online resources for learning chemistry? So for me, I would say some of the main ones would be like Organic Chemistry Portal. They have a lot of different useful reactions. There's a lot of information on there that's really useful. Another really good one is Phil Barron's YouTube Heterocycle course. He has a newer version from 2021 that's on there, but the 2019 version was quite good in my experience as well. If you ever want to do free online university courses, you can do that through the site called EDX. There's other sites like this available, but I've had uh, quite a lot of success trying stuff on EDX before. Um, and they also have chemistry content usually. Additionally, Reaction Flash is another really good resource. These ha this has uh, all the named reactions, most of the ones that you'd consider qualifying as a named reaction. If you think that there's ever any that don't, that aren't on there that should be on there, you can reach out to Peter Kadoff and he is usually more likely than not willing to uh, help you out. So uh, if you think Reaction should go in there, absolutely. This is a free app, you can download it for free. They usually have mechanisms, and examples for each reaction. Now, they're not always perfect and correct, but the the team at Elsevier is very good at listening to feedback, so if you ever have any issues with it, please submit those. I would really recommend anyone doing organic chemistry in any capacity take a look at this app because it's really useful. What's your ranking of each chemistry field? Also, what are your favorite fields, organic not included? So let's start this off. So we obviously know organic is an easy S tier. But since organic is S tier, I'm only going to put um, each field into a, a separate tier on their own. And so chemical engineering is pretty useful. I mean, you'd know that based on salary alone. It's probably one of the highest paying chemistry jobs. It's really important, really useful. You get to solve interesting problems as long as you don't get like stuck in a rut where people just want you to keep things running. You need to be able to keep being creative. Now, inorganic is pretty useful. I'm kind of judging these from an organic perspective, like how useful they are towards organic chemistry because I'm an organic chemist. Now, inorganic chemistry, sometimes they'll produce useful things that solve some of our problems, but a lot of the time they just make obscure complexes. And it's not like just, it's still helping our fundamental knowledge of chemistry. But I'm I'm fairly utilitarian in terms of what I consider about different, uh, different domains of chemistry. Now, I would say it's similar with biochemistry where, you know, there's not a ton of biochemical transformations that we would use. You know, we might use Baker's yeast or occasionally enzymatic transformations, but I'd say the acceptance of those is still fairly rare. If those biochemical processes are being used to make starting materials, that's great, but that's not well documented and it's not well communicated. So if the biochemists think that what they're doing does matter, they need to start producing more content highlighting that. Uh, if you'd be interested in me covering some of that in the future, I might consider going and touring some places where they use biochemical transformations to create chemical feedstocks. Now, in D tier, we have analytical chemistry. I don't hate analytical chemistry, but a lot of the time, the solutions that are made via research groups take a long time to be applicable to everyone else. You know, maybe there's like a new NMR method that's developed, then, okay, sure, you could just do that on most NMRs, assuming it's something easy, easily transferable. But if like a new type of detector or something is made, usually it's a big ordeal getting funding and stuff. So it's harder for me to be convinced of the utility of analytical chemistry. Now, physical chemistry is going into E tier. It's not that I dislike physical chemistry. It's that a lot of the time it seems somewhat esoteric or maybe it doesn't have as much direct utility with an exception of for Mayer's end parameters. Okay. Mayer's end parameters would make me way more likely than not to consider doing physical chemistry solely for the purpose of there's a ton of um, un unused potential there, right? In terms of uh, predicting new reactions, which we haven't discovered yet, and in terms of rationalizing why certain reactions do work and why other ones don't. So physical chemistry can be useful for understanding stuff, um, but more often than not, it it would be the type of paper I would never go out of my way to read unless I absolutely had to. And the same would go for literally any field other than organic, which I think is fair once you're in a discipline. So it's not that I 
hate any of these fields. It's just that they aren't as interesting to me, although they can be quite interesting in their own right to people who are interested in them. Your thoughts on publishing, impact factors, and what is a good journal? What is novelty or originality, and when is something truly well-known? So this is actually a really great question, and I think I'm going to make a video on this in the future. If you think I should make a video about this, let me know down below. And if you keep commenting stuff on several videos, eventually I'll just like see it and respond to it. So if I ever miss a question, just make sure you like comment a couple times. Maybe not on the same video, but on different videos. What was your favorite course that was not related to your PhD? So I would say that my favorite course is probably digital recording because I really love music. And if you're part of the Discord, I'd highly encourage you to recommend music in the That Chemist Spam channel. I will definitely listen to your music recommendations, especially if the first couple you leave are good. Um, and I would say in general, I love making music. I just haven't put as many skill points into that, so to speak. Um, I really enjoy the process of digital recording. I really love the quality of music that can be produced with creativity. And it was my favorite course that I did uh, when I was in undergrad. It would be really awesome if you'd talk a bit about some stress factors and possible burnout, which an academic career as a scientist, professor, etc., might give rise to, and how to keep such things under control. As a chemistry undergraduate, I happen to deal with such aspects quite often. So I would say one of the best things you can do is work smart. And some people say work smart, not hard, but usually you need to work smart and work hard. So working smart just means thinking really critical about stuff and, you know, figuring out why you're doing stuff. Like, why are you working on the project you're working on? Is the purpose of the project to do the project or is it to train you? Like, what's actually being accomplished here? Um, and just trying to understand the, the actual purpose for stuff that goes on. And so some people will, you know, cut out every other part of their life. They'll cut out their family, their friends, and all they'll do is put time into research. But oftentimes that's not a recipe for success. So one thing that I like to think about is the spillover effect. So just because you want to become a better researcher doesn't mean that's going to happen by doing more research. Quite often does. But, you know, there's a point where doing other things will make you a better researcher because the positive increase in those areas of your life or positive increase in your knowledge about other areas can have a spillover effect where it starts making relevant connections into your research world. Now, I don't think necessarily like becoming the best researcher, or the best scientist um, that you could possibly be is necessarily the most important thing you can do with your life. Um, however, you know, you should do whatever you're going to do well. You should, you know, be proud of what you do and make sure that you're doing it because you love it and that you want to do it or that you want to see it get finished and get finished well instead of just, you know, doing the bare minimum and getting it, getting it through. You want to do a good job. And so my, my advice would be try and improve other areas of your life and oftentimes uh, your research will improve as well. So thank you for watching this video. If you like this Q&A, uh, please comment down below and maybe I'll do another one in the future. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribe and I hope you have a great day.